Okay, whoa. Check, 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 check. All right, I'm gonna keep chatting. They'll adjust me up there, perfect. All right, well, good morning. Welcome to worship here at First Lutheran Church and School. It's great to be here with you today. The Lord's blessings upon your worship. A couple of announcements uh, that we have this morning. Uh, first of all, yesterday was uh, the LWML Holiday Bazaar. It was awesome. I'm very glad I pre-ordered some bread because uh, I, I was here at uh, 12.30 and almost all of the baked goods, with the exception of a few, were gone. So the bake sale was a success. The craft sale was a success. Thank you so much to everyone who came out, who supported the vendors, uh, who just showed up and shopped. Thank you so much for all those who uh, baked goods. And on behalf of the LWML, a big thank you. It was an outstanding event. This, uh, this past Friday was a Veterans Day, and we had a special Veterans Day presentation here in the chapel for our veterans. But it would be fitting and proper this day, as this Sunday is close to Veterans Day, that we recognize uh, all, any veterans in our congregation. So I'm going to ask any veterans, if you served in any branch of the armed forces, to please go ahead and stand so that we may recognize you and thank you for your service this morning. Thank you for your service. A copy of that presentation, in case you're unable to be here for that Veterans Day presentation, is up on our YouTube channel, and we'll be going out uh, in a link as well this day through uh, the email from the church office, so you'll have that. All right. Uh, with no other announcements that I am aware of, why don't we stand and greet each other in the peace and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord's blessings on your worship this morning. It is in baptism that the name of our Lord was placed upon us, the triune name of our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is no coincidence that the baptismal font is the place that we see first when we enter into the sanctuary. For here you and I became a child of God. His name placed upon us the cross over our head and over our heart. And it is in his name that we begin this morning in our baptism. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord is faithful. He is us and guards us in safety. The Lord is steadfast. He our hearts to love our language. We can be confident in the Lord and his love for us. May he grant us
brothers and sisters in Christ in our lives. We struggle to follow Jesus' example of love, steadfastness, and faith. We have shown hatred, we have shown laziness, and have known many doubts. We have not kept our eyes fixed on Jesus. Yet our Heavenly Father invites us to draw near to His throne in confidence and to ask for forgiveness. Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in thoughts, words, and actions. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us back to you on account of Jesus. Help us to serve in joy and love. Almighty God, in his great mercy, has given his son to die for you, and for his sake, forgives you all of your sins. As your pastor, it is my privilege to announce this grace to you. And as he has commanded and given me his authority to do so, in his stead and by his command, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are forgiven in the steadfast love of Christ. and ever-living God, you have given exceedingly great and precious promises to those who trust in you. Rule and govern our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may live and abide forever in your Son. Amen. You may be seated. This time we invite the children in our congregation to come forward for their special time of the service, our children's message. So kids, come on down, and those who want to be a child again, come on down too. Our, prince, our, uh, our children's message today is with Principal Gabbard.
I think God has some words of wisdom for us today. I'll tell you, there we go. Good morning. How are you guys today? What's our theme for this year? Fruit of the Spirit. Guess what I have in my bag? All sorts of fruit. That's right. Uh, we have, I have second grade math this year. I've never taught below fifth grade. So second grade is quite the challenge, but we're having a lot of fun. We like to play what we call the sorting game, or how are things different? So we're going to look in here. We're going to start out with an easy one. So I got two fruits here. What do you think is the difference between these two? Do you know what they are, Tessa? One's a lemon and a lime. That was pretty easy to spot the difference, isn't it? Yeah, a lemon and a lime. You like lemon? Oh, well that's true. It could be. It needs to ripe a little bit more. How about these two? Oh, now these look awful close together, but they are different. For Florida people, we all know what these are. Do you know what these are? No? Uh-oh. Do you know what they are? You're close. That's an orange and that's a grapefruit. Very cool. Yeah, you're awfully close. Okay, so they look alike, but they're different, aren't they? All right, let's see if we can get a harder one. Uh-oh. Whoa, whoa, look at these things. <laughs> what are they? A bigger banana and a banana. I like that. Good answer. Does anybody know what the bigger banana is called? Somebody in the audience? Pastor? It's called a plantain. That's right. They look really much alike, don't they? Yeah. So in our gospel today, it says that Jesus is going to come back and he's going to play the sorting game. Not really much of a game, but he's going to sort based on goats and sheep. And I'm like, wow, what's the difference between a goat and a sheep? I got a picture here. Can you tell me there's three goats and three sheep? Look at this and see if you can tell me which ones are the goats and which ones are the sheep. That's a goat. That's a sheep, actually. What about you? Wow. That one's a sheep? Wow, very cool. Let me see if you're right, because I don't know. That one is a sheep. Good job. What do you think? Goats and sheep look awful much alike, don't they? But there must be something different about a goat and a sheep that God would put sheep on the right hand and goats on the left. So we have to figure out what in the world that is. I have one more. Now these aren't really fruits. What are these? Easter eggs, right? And what do these Easter eggs usually do? They have something on the inside, don't they? So let's open this one up and see what's in there. It's empty. There's nothing in this one. Well, that's strange. Well, let's see what's in this one. Oh, there's something in there. What's in there? Can you read that? No. Holy Spirit. That's right. One of these has a the Holy Spirit inside of them. And the Holy Spirit enables us to do all sorts of good things for God. And so when we see somebody who is needing our help, we go and help them. And it tells us in the Bible that if we help them, it's like we're helping God. And he says, to us belongs the kingdom of God. So every time you guys do something amazing for one of your friends or from your family members or something like that, you're doing it for Jesus. That's pretty cool. And you're going to be with him for all eternity. 
That is neat. And so sometimes things look the same on the outside, don't they? Sometimes we have to look inside of our hearts and in our lives and see what's really going on. And if we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, good things are going to come out. And we're going to bear the fruit of the Spirit. And that's amazing. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit that comes into our lives and fills our heart with your love and your joy and your peace and your patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. Dear Heavenly Father, as we see those who have needs around us, let us be quick to react to them, help them out and lend to them, so that as we are doing that, we can share your love and your kindness with them. We thank you for these children and their willingness to learn of you and your, their, develop their faith. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. You guys have a great day. First lesson uh, this morning is from Malachi, the, the fourth chapter. The prophet foretells the day of the Lord's arrival. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and evildoers will stumble. The day is coming, the day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. You shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and the rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day that the Lord comes, and he will turn the heart of the fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
Lesson this morning is from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may spread ahead and be honored as happening among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing good and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not according with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some amongst you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly, and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the Alleluia. <laughs> According to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his throne, glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you, a stranger, and welcome you, or naked, and clothe you? And when did we see you sick, or in prison, and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me, naked, and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then I will also answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will say to them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the gospel 
of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for our devotion this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, the 18th chapter. As he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And hearing a multitude going by, he inquired what this meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. This is the text. Well, we may as well start with God because he has a way of getting into it soon enough anyway. We may as well start with God and his love in a world where violence and, and confusion and despair are pandemic, when the, the world's problems seem insurmountable and the threat of uh, nuclear disaster or worse hangs heavy over our heads. We may as well begin with God, though right now there are some who uh, think that God has had his chance and since he muffed it, think it's perfectly valid to question whether there is one, a God, I mean. You and I believe there is. Furthermore, I believe he is saying something in these days, not just trying to, as if he were at a loss how to make himself known. The problem more likely is with our, our hearing. Perhaps uh, our text from the end of the 18th chapter of Luke will be instructive. Hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. They told him Jesus of Nazareth passes by. And he cried, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus answered him, what do you want me to do for you? He said, let me receive my sight. And Jesus said, receive your sight. Now, that's the story of what happened to a beggar who couldn't see. And it happened because he cocked an ear, asked a question, made a decision, stumbled forward, and fell on his knees before Jesus of Nazareth. If that were all there was to it, I'd, I'd think the, the epic was grand enough. But that isn't. That isn't all. At least I don't think so. Suddenly, if, if you watch it long enough, it begins to dawn on you that this is history you are watching. Current history. But the turmoil. The, the turmoil which surrounded the beggar as he sat blind by the side of the road is not unlike the rush of events which sweep us along and like him, perhaps, we peer into the darkness and fear a world gone mad. The cause of the turmoil that swirled around the beggar was God. Hearing the multitude pass by, he inquired what it meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth. It would be strange, wouldn't it, if it were the same for us? If behind the clamor of these past few weeks, as I, as I remember it, devastating forest fires in, 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 in California, Russia's continued in invasion of the Ukraine, more school shootings, this time in Uvalde and uh, St. Louis, uh, a, a disease that, that has changed our lives, wrecked havoc and changed our lives in, in unimaginable ways, not to mention our beloved nation in danger of spinning apart because both sides of the political aisle are determined to win and not to love. It would be strange, wouldn't it? If behind all that turmoil, the real significance of all that clamor was the presence of our God, Hearing the multitude going by, he inquired what it meant. I don't see how you can miss it, the clamor. I mean, not if you got your ear to the ground or your eye on the television set. I mean, only the meaning seems to escape us. 
things aren't good, and we, we can tell that by, by the reading the paper or looking to each other's eyes, but that's about all that the popular mind can, can grasp. We've never stopped to ask ourselves what lies behind it all. Hearing the multitude going by, he inquired what it meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth. I'm going to suggest that it still means God. Well, you wouldn't expect that, would you? I mean, God behind the clamor? It seems all wrong. In Jesus, we, we've come to know a little bit about our God. Whatever else he is, if the Bible knows what he's talking about, uh, he's compassionate. This much we know from the times we, we've watched him lay his fingers on deaf ears to make them hear, on mute lips to make them uh, speak. He's forgiveness itself. Stretching a hand out over a man sick with the palsy, over a, a publican, over a three-time losing disciple, and finally both hands from a cross over an entire world whispering, your sins are forgiven. God, God is love. I could have sworn that's what the good book meant by the story of the coming and going of God's Son upon the earth to heal the hurt, forgive the, the, the iniquity of all the world, a God of love behind the noise. Now, mind you, I didn't say that God held in his hand that those school shooters in Texas and Missouri or those Russian rockets slamming into Kiev. I do say he holds all of human history in his hands, which has been unfolding with such a clamor around our ears of late. And to all those questions which begin, well then, will you please tell me why does God? I'll have to answer in all honesty, I just don't know. The only thing I, we know about God outside of his love for us in Jesus is that he is incalculable. Whatever else he is, he's God. You can't extend the lines of your reason and, and, and find him. You can't get up on your tiptoes and say, there, 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 that's God over, over. You can't do that. He isn't what you think except as he is disposed to love us as his children. In Jesus Christ, the transcendent God, the, the holy other, the transcendent God broke into our existence in a way that we can see and touch and at least begin to understand. Other than that, we just don't know. Our logic doesn't make his kind of sense. I think we ought to tell ourselves that solemnly. All we know is Jesus. The rest is hidden from us and none of it is subject to our judgment. I sometimes think that, that if we had even the faintest concept of his real majesty, we would abruptly stop asking questions like, will you please tell me then why does God? <laughs> Nobody on earth can blueprint the mind of God. <laughs> and if anybody thinks he's living in a world where his own notions about how God ought to act it will, and do things is not, are not going to be overturned, he's simply no student of God's history. The plain fact is, you are not particularly safe in your job, your health, or your home with a living, active God around. God doesn't think of us the way we think of ourselves. Doesn't limit us to the horizons we set. Doesn't deal with us according to the lines we've laid down. It's silly to doubt him, because you can't understand him. I'd sooner doubt him as I could, if I could. Which brings me to this. If this really should be our reading of life, that it's God behind the clamor, then it seems to me that we've got to keep the beggar company. He, he scrambled up, threw aside his little tin cup with its copper pennies, and made for the road where Jesus was. It means, I think, that we are like that poor blind beggar. Not blind, maybe, but surely nearsighted, so that in this world of ours, we still have trouble, an awful lot of trouble, seeing past our copper penny gods, gods like technology and bank accounts and bombs. Now, now comes the, the clamor with Almighty God behind it to remind us that he's still there. Could that be it, do you suppose? God clumping his foot 
to impress us with the folly of begging a few paltry pence of happiness from the kind of God you can stuff into your shopping cart or fold into your wallet? Is it God, I wonder, reminding us that he goes beyond the pulpit and, and the pew, presides over other days than those we naively call holy? <laughs> I've lived long enough to know how it goes, how, how we, we go around uh, Monday calling it blue, Tuesday and Wednesday, just another day at the office. Thursday, nothing much. Thank God it's Friday. And Saturday's football game. Uh, you wouldn't recognize your own brother. You locked him out of six days of your life like that. Right? Is that, is that what it, just noise is all about? Inside and outside the church? God pounding at the desk and saying, do you remember me? If it is, then with the beggar, we must go to the road where Jesus stands and cry, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me that I may receive my sight. Sight. That's it. Not answers, so we can understand why all this is happening. And not protection, so we might be spared the agony. But sight. The ability, in the midst of it all, to look up and see that God is there. That happened one day to a, a man I, I read about. He, he had lost his son in a plane crash. When the news came, he went over to the place where his pastor was, didn't bother to ring the bell, just walked right in the door through the dining room and into the pastor's study. Will you please tell me, he said, where God was when my son was killed? And in that terrible moment, the other answered, exactly the same place he was when his son was killed, on the throne behind it all, managing things for your sake and mine, if we could but receive our sight. And Jesus answered, receive your sight. And suddenly the beggar saw more than the passing multitude. He saw the God behind the clamor. And he rejoiced. We too have received our sight. Already in, in our baptism, God has opened our eyes and shown us his power and his love. And if we fail to see the God behind the clamor, it is only because we have closed our eyes to his truth. Jesus answered, receive your sight. And you think that's the end of the story, but it's not because there's always a road to be walked and, and a job to be done when you have your sight. The now sighted beggar set out following Jesus. And we, <laughs> that's what we're here to talk about, God and the job we have to do because of him. Our job, but not our work. It's the work of God, starting with the monumental project by which the worlds were formed, going on as God acts in the cataclysmic events of history and culminating in finally bringing this age to a close. God works in the world. But not just on a, a grand and, and glorious scale. God acts in individual lives and in singular circumstances. We mustn't forget that. Somebody said, It'd be a good idea if we just got rid of the notion that God isn't interested in anything besides religion. We don't gather with God just at church. St. Paul reminds us, in him we live and move and have our being. God is at work at the Capitol and the courtroom. God goes to school and, and the office in the morning. He goes on to work and on the highway and in the laboratory and at the hospital. God's great work was done in Jesus. You see pictures of Jesus struggling with the agony and, and blood of, of the cross, taking man's evil and atoning for it by his death on Calvary, a move to move God and, and the world closer together. But even that doesn't bring to an end the story of, of God's work in the world, for God is at work in the world today through those in whom he has already worked. That's where we come in. Jesus not only died for us, he rose again to live in us. 
And God takes this that Jesus did in Palestine 2,000 years ago and hurries it across the centuries so that it can settle like a mantle on the shoulders of his people. Maybe the church today doesn't look like much to you. Maybe it seems like an inefficient gathering of people who seldom practice what they preach. But it is the people upon whom God has worked the miracle of faith and in whom he is eager now to work another. God would use our word of witness. He will use our tongues, our feet, our hands to bathe the world in the knowledge of salvation, to heal and comfort this world with Christian love. God is at work in the world through each of us. Each of us has been called to be the instrument through which God works. Now, this is no, no pat cliche. It's the whole point. The beggar saw that. He responded by following Jesus, glorifying God, and the multitude, when they saw it, gave glory to God as well. The God who stands behind the clamor of this world, who, who gave sight to the beggar and opened our eyes to see his forgiveness and his constant care, now calls us to faithfulness and love as he continues to bless our tumultuous world. How will you respond to God's redeeming love? Amen. Now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we stand together for the confession of our faith this morning through the words of the Apostles' Creed. Saints of God, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all in Jesus Christ, his only Son, the Lord, was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. He will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for a moment this morning. You'll, you'll notice um, we have a, a new banner, a beautiful new banner that enhances our worship as it focuses our attention on Christ, on the center of all things. Uh, this morning it is uh, fitting and proper that we bless this new banner and give thanks to those who provided it for us. Beloved in the Lord, the Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put his strength as his belt. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are his sanctuary. It is therefore fitting that we implore the Lord's blessing as we clothe this sanctuary with that which his strengthens us and preserves us in the true faith. O Lord Almighty, as you instructed Moses, your servant, to make hangings of fine linens for use in your tabernacle, we implore you to sanctify this banner for the adornment of your church. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless this banner. Amen. We continue our worship this morning giving thanks and praise to the Lord as the giving of our tithes and our offerings. We are mindful of the fact that everything we have is God's. We return a portion of it in thanks and in thanksgiving for the continuation of his work both here and around the world. This morning we pray for our tithes and our offerings that, they, that those gifts brought forward may be blessed and extended throughout the world. O Lord, almighty God, we give you thanks and praise for all we have is yours. We return a portion of it to you this day. 
knowing that you will take this and multiply these gifts for the proclamation of your gospel through your church, both here and abroad. The power of the Holy Spirit in your son's name. Amen. together this morning as we pray for the whole church and all who are in need. Lord, we have filled our lives with so much busyness and chaos. Help us to remove from our lives those things that are not beneficial and to lead quiet, peaceful lives that honor you. We are frequently tempted towards laziness and slothfulness. Strengthen us to not be idle or lazy, but to work diligently for the good of our neighbors. You have borne our griefs and shared our sorrows. Comfort all of those who are suffering in grief. Point them to the hope of the resurrection to eternal life with Jesus. We pray for all of those who are single, whether by choice or circumstance. Be with them, Lord, and surround them with family and community so they may know the joys of fellowship and be kept from the agony of loneliness. We pray that your word might speed ahead so that all people may hear the good news of your salvation. Embolden us to share that good news with others. Look with favor upon all of those who are sick, injured, or recovering. Especially we lift before you those who were recently impacted by Hurricane Nicole. Have mercy upon them and restore them according to your good wisdom. We commend all these people and situations into your hands for you have promised to hear our prayers and to intercede for us as you live and reign with the holy spirit the father and the father one god now and forever amen
go in peace and serve the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his great love and grant you his peace. Amen.